Okay, so what sort of attacks do we have on RSA? Um, there's a lot out there. I'm just going to cover a few sort of examples of, of what you might be interested um, in getting a feel for how this can actually be attacked. So as we mentioned, RSA is basically built around this factorization problem. Um, there was something called the RSA challenge. I don't know if any of them are actually still active, but it basically provided a small incentive to demonstrate um, how you could factorize stuff because we knew that a smaller, basically as we add bits, the problem becomes harder because the, the numbers um, increase very rapidly. So this is a short table showing um, the known attacks on our, not known attacks, but the known results of factorizing different sizes of RSA. So you can see here, this binary digits would be like your typical when we say RSA 1024 um, or something like that. So some of the numbers, it's a bit confusing if you just look at it quickly because some of the numbers use the actual length of the, the, the decimal digit, right? Like RSA 150, which has a, a different number of binary digits in it. So just watch out for that if you're looking at it. Um, but very briefly, right? Uh, you can see that, for example, a 576 um, or uh, bit length RSA, right, um, was attacked in December 2003, right, so this was some time ago, um, they were able to recover the key from it. So it basically, if someone had uh, a message encrypted with that RSA 576, um, then they could pretty quickly break it to recover the key. Um, and if we go all the way down to what is the most recent attack on a 768-bit RSA, um, you can see this was done in, um, oh wait, no, sorry, let's go down a little further, 829. Uh, in February 2020, we had an attack on RSA um, with 829 bits in it. And to give you a feel for, for what that uh, looks like, right, this is the challenge number. So the, the way this is written is that you're given a challenge text and it's basically find what two primes were used um, to create that. And these were the two primes that they were able to calculate must have been used. Um, and you can see it's taking roughly uh, 2,700 core years, they call it, because obviously they're not doing this on one core. Um, we're using many, many cores to do this as quickly as possible. Um, but it gives you sort of a feel for what length of time is needed um, for you know, small versions of RSA. Um, the important thing to remember is that all sort of binary searches have this nice um, exponential uh, increase in time. So every time we add a single bit, it's actually a, a doubling of um, what the, su the size would be. Sort of roughly, right? So. Um, the, the point is here that, you know, if we're talking about RSA with 700 or so bits, um, the difference between that and 1024 and 2048 is huge. So once you get up to RSA 2048, right, you're looking at um, huge amounts of times to, to search this space. So you're kind of in the billions plus of years is what would be the estimate. So it's so long that it seems irrelevant. Um, the other note, right, is that I, I say sort of kind of doubles and seems irrelevant because there's one important caveat here. Um, it's that you can have different flaws or implementation changes that actually make it the search space smaller than just a pure brute force search. Um, so the sort of trade-off you make is you make the RSA key so long that even if there are some of these mistakes, it doesn't, uh, it still makes it impractical to search. Um, so some, and one example, a really basic example of that implementation flaw is that RSA is in itself deterministic. So I want to emphasize again that we would need, you know, some protocol around it, um, to solve this. And, and this simply means, right, if, that if we had RSA, right, and you had a public key, so let's say I published a key, right, and I said, use this key, everyone in the world, use this key to encrypt messages you send to me. Um, and you send hello to me, right? And it encrypts to whatever. We'll make it a number here. Um, well, remember that public key, anyone else has access to that public key. So if, if you have the public key and you wanna figure out what someone else is sending me, um, you could just try encrypting a whole bunch of messages, right? because it's deterministic. So if you get, use my public key, 
and you encrypt like hi I hate you whatever you want to say to me um, hello right you'll get different outputs and if this is deterministic um, right it might encrypt the first time to something else right five two or five yeah five two six one um one two three four right and then that final one matches and so you haven't broken anything you've just sort of brute forced what possible messages could be sent to me um so the padding scheme is to make sure we don't have that so that's not really an attack on rsa itself it's just an attack on the usage of it um there is a few other kind of more interesting attacks on implementations of it um, so one of the most common implementages, implementations uses something called the Chinese remainder theorem. Um, and basically what happens is it turns out that these operations here, these exponentiations, um, these modulus exponentiations are very, very slow. Um, and it's faster to split them up. So rather than doing one operation on a 2048 bit number, it's faster to do two 1024-bit um, number operations, sort of, you know, in a very high level. Um, and what we basically do is we take this operation, right, and we we convert our D um, into two things, DQ and DP, right? So this operation here actually gets split up into two operations. And they're roughly combined together. There's a tiny bit more to it than just multiplying them. But the basic idea is that we could combine, um, we could split this operation into two operations and then combine the results. Um, and it's much faster. So this is very good, we like this. Um, the problem comes about, and there's uh, two links here. So the original work on this, and there's a nice sort of overview demo of it. Um, if you're interested, is basically that uh, when we split it up like this, if we insert a fault into one of these operations, um, which is to say one of those operations does not actually calculate the right result, um, we get an output that makes it very easy to calculate. So if, if we, we don't correctly calculate this, there's just an error when the computer is running, maybe someone uh, purposely inserts an error, something like that, there's some memory corruption. Um, it makes it incredibly easy for an attacker to suddenly um, calculate the p-value and then they can find everything else out of it. So. Um, there are some, you know, specific attacks on implementations, and we'll look at this one in particular uh, when we get to fault attacks. Um, luckily, this has an easy solution. You can check the results before returning it to a user or a potential attacker. Um, the other thing you might hear about is quantum computing. Um, so quantum computing and RSA, there's lots of, of talk about how this, you know, could make RSA obsolete or could break all encryption. You'll hear all sorts of stuff. Um, what does this actually mean? Basically, quantum computing has a very good known algorithm or a quantum algorithm um, to solve the interfactorization problem. This is known as Shor's algorithm. Um, as an example, to give you some practicality to this though, um, factoring RSA 2048 with a suitably sized quantum computing. So here's the, the problem right now a 20 million qubit computer, so we measure quantum computers in the, the number of qubits normally. Um, it takes about eight hours to do that. So, so you know, rather than the billions of years that it would take a classical computer, even a huge one, right, you're looking at eight hours. Um, so that's where quantum computing becomes very interesting. Actually building such a large quantum computer is a very hard problem. Um, there's some physical uh, interactions between qubits that makes this um, not clear how exactly we'd reach that or when we'd reach that. So the best I can show you is that, you know, the number of qubits um, in actual computers that have run um, here, and I think there, I know there were some that were planned to be quite a bit higher for 2020, so I don't know if those came online or not. Um, but what you can see is that, you know, the, the number of qubits is still quite low. Um, you know, IBM, and this was what I mentioned more recently, they said they had like a thousand qubit quantum computer by 2023. So who knows if they've actually um, solved that problem for real. Um, but the point is that people are looking at larger quantum computers. Um, the other important thing is that uh, the number of qubits required may go down and probably will go down as better algorithms are developed. Quantum computing is still fairly new, right? How we build algorithms for it is still an area of research. 
Um, as an example, so that this RSA 2048 example um, originally required a billion qubits. So when it was first said, here's how you could factor it, you needed one billion in qubits. Uh, in 2017, right, an improved algorithm brought that down to 230 million. Um, and in 2019, then the latest was saying you only needed 20 million qubits, right? So if this continues to go down, there might be a faster intersection, right? We might not have a 20 million qubit computer for a long, long time, but maybe we only need a million qubits and it turns out we'll get a million qubit computer in 10 years. Um, so we may have this collision of the attacks improving substantially and um, improvements in quantum computing catching up. Um, the one thing I'll, I'll put a strong caveat on all of this because this is something you might run across. Um, symmetric algorithms like AES are not known or not known to be uh, known anyway to be broken by quantum computing. Uh, what basically happens is the effective key size, so the best known quantum computing algorithms give you an attack that reduces the key size by half. So AES-256 becomes AES-128, for example. Um, this isn't a serious threat, so yes, it's not as good. Um, it's still so large. So even if we built had a quantum computer that can do this, um, this reduction in half, it's still such a hard problem or such a huge key space to search really um, that it's, you know, for any foreseeable future, not an issue. So um, important thing to note with quantum computing is it could be a serious threat for asymmetric, so RSA um, and ECC uh, in particular, it's not believed to be a serious threat for symmetric algorithms. So uh, when you're looking at algorithms and how they could be broken, um, it's just something to keep in mind because you will occasionally see claims um, about quantum computing breaking all current cryptography. That's not true. Um, it does, you know, it is very damaging though for RSA and um, other asymmetric algorithms. Yeah, so in the past 43 years, quick summary, um, you know, from when RSA was introduced in 1977, um, there's basically no great attacks on it. Um, there's been no serious recommendations to move away from it. So for some of some other algorithms, there was recommendations, you know, not to use it for certain um, secrecy levels that suggested governments knew about attacks. Um, there's basically no indication that there's anything fundamentally wrong with it. Um, quantum computing is the sort of only known uh, thing that could really break it down fully. Um, and so it has this theoretical potential basically to break it, um, pending on how large and how good quantum computers get and how fast. Um, the best attacks on it are really going to be using um, something we haven't talked about yet called side channels. Um, but also with faults. So I showed you really briefly, you know, how there's this um, uh, implementation where you split up uh, the secret value, uh, the, that secret end value was created from P and Q. So we split up the private key into a P portion and a Q portion. Um, and if one of them is calculated incorrectly, it ends up giving you a, a really easy attack. So we're gonna come back to that because we'll talk about faults and inserting faults. Um, and that's one of the things we'll, we'll look at how you do. Um, but I just want to mention that, you know, it is in fact possible to do certain attacks on it um, if you have physical access to the devices.